Uh, to the inquisitorial representative, regarding the Silver Templars Space Marine chapter, my lord, as per your instructions, I have been examining and monitoring the progress of the Primaris project as they continue to replace the existing Adeptus Astartes pattern of warriors and are used solely for the creation of new chapters by order of the Lord Commander. As a result of this, I have compiled a number of reports which I will be disseminating amongst our partner organizations so that new recruits to our glorious Inquisition may have a more learned approach in working alongside our fellow Imperial Defenders. To that end, I present to you a history of the Silver Templars. The galaxy is riven by war and assaulted by the foul forces of chaos. In the wake of the Cisastrix Maledictum, the forces of the Adeptus Astartes are stretched as never before. Xenos, demon, traitor, and heretic alike emerge from the darkness between stars to prey upon the worlds of the Imperium. Thankfully for the citizens of the Imperium, the Silver Templars stand ready to defend the weak and crush the enemies of the Emperor. Descending onto the battlefields of the 41st millennium in a flash of silver fury, the warriors of Novaris have halted invasions, scoured alien forces from dozens of worlds, and purged heretics in their thousands. For the Silver Templars, there shall be no rest until the many enemies of mankind have been ground to dust beneath their armoured boots, and the followers of Chaos have been banished to the furthest, darkest corners of the war. They are warriors of Novaris, and none shall stand before their furious storm of silver and steel. Well, at least that's what the common people should see. The Silver Templars were established during the Ultima founding and are comprised entirely of Primaris Space Marines. They are the direct successors of the Ultramarines and continue their legacy as defenders of the Imperium. The Silver Templars are amongst the newest additions to the ever-growing ranks of the Ultramarine successor chapters, Though their battle record is still growing, they have already established themselves, having fought alongside the Ultramarines during the Plague Wars. The Silver Templars have gained a reputation as cold and utterly focused warriors who display little emotion. They are expert duelists, preferring to select a single target and focus their attention on eliminating this chosen opponent before selecting a fresh target. The Silver Templar strategy often revolves around carving a path to enemy leaders so that their most powerful warriors can engage the foe in a duel to the death. All very honourable. The Silver Templars are accomplished weaponsmiths, even if they do say so themselves, often crafting their own weapons and establishing a link with its machine spirit, known as the Bond Marshal. Once this bond is established, a Silver Templar will devote himself to mastering the weapon's use. Losing a bonded weapon is a mark of great shame, and a warrior will go to great lengths to reclaim one that has been lost. Born into a galaxy riven by war, the Silver Templars are eager to prove themselves to either their Primarch and their Emperor. Throwing themselves into combat against the Imperium's countless foes with wanton abandon. As you will know, my lord, following the heresy, it was deemed unwise to allow fighting forces with the strength of the legions to continue to operate. To that end, they were split up into chapters of 1,000 marines and given areas of space to garrison, for the most part. The Codex Astartes is the tome that guides the organization of all Space Marine chapters. 
penned by Ribute Gilliman after the conclusion of the heresy. Its primary goal was to limit the power that could be wielded by a single leader and ensure that no such civil war would occur again. A notion which I find to be quite optimistic considering the nature of humanity. With the formal introduction of the Codex, the second founding began. The Loyalist Space Marine Legions were divided into chapters, each a thousand strong as I've said. These chapters were then spread across the galaxy so that they could defend the vast Imperium of Mankind from its many enemies. The Codex also provided instructions for recruitment and training, designed to purge mutations and protect the Space Marine's precious gene seed. After the miraculous return of Rebute Gilliman, or praise he, the Codex was altered to better serve the needs of the Imperium in the wake of the Great Rift, and to account for the introduction, so to speak, of the Primaris Space Marines. The Silver Templars follow standard codex structure, consisting of ten companies of space marines, each 100 warriors strong. Each is commanded by a captain, who is assisted by a pair of lieutenants, a chaplain, an apothecary, an ancient, although how ancient they can truly be is a matter of debate, and a retinue of veterans. The rest of the company is divided into squads of ten or five warriors, the first company is made up of the chapter's most experienced warriors. Veterans who wish to join the first company's ranks must swear a sword oath to complete a task set by the company's captain. The warriors who swear these oaths must complete them or die in the attempt. The first company rarely fights as one unit, usually taking to the field alongside the other companies so they may benefit from their experience. The 2nd, 3rd, 4th and 5th companies are battle companies and do most of the chapter's fighting. They usually consist of 6 battle line squads, 2 close support squads and 2 fire support squads, forming a balanced force to take on any foe. When the Silver Templars go to war, they usually deploy a single battle company supported by troops from the veteran scout and reserve companies. The reserve companies are each made up of squads of the same designation. The 6th and 7th company are battle line companies. They can be moved into a battle company to replace losses during a campaign. The 8th company is the close support company. Rivers and inceptors from the 8th company often make up the first wave of an invasion force disrupting enemy lines and causing panic before the main force arrives. The warriors of the 8th company are also expert at responding quickly to support their brothers when needed. The 9th company is the fire support company. It is made up of hell blasters and other heavy weapons squads. They will often be called to assist a battle company when they need additional firepower. The tenth and final company of the Silver Templars is the Scout Company. It consists of fresh recruits whose training is incomplete. They are often tasked with reconnaissance missions during their training process. And, based upon the reports I have read, the standard training of Space Marines has been continued now that the Primaris have settled in, so to speak. There was a consideration or a concern that the organizations of chapters would alter drastically with the Primaris, but now that they have taken over the same responsibilities as the older existing chapters, they have moved into the same training methods, with young recruits serving in the scout companies, rather than what was originally assumed that these young recruits would immediately don full battle plate and join one of the main battle companies, or specialists. Directly below Chapter Master Zenaris, ten captains are responsible for commanding the ten companies that make up the Silver Templars chapter. Each of them is a powerful warrior in his own right, and is a master of all ways of war. 
They are experts at coordinating and inspiring their troops to fight with absolute precision and discipline. Each company has two lieutenants. These officers assist their captain and each is capable of leading half of the company in battle, freeing up the captain to concentrate on the overarching strategy or to seek out and duel enemy commanders. By eliminating the enemy leadership, they weaken opposing forces and embolden their own troops. The Silver Templar's chaplains tend to the spiritual needs of the chapter. Silver Templar warriors often swear sword oaths. These oaths are promises made to their chapter, usually to defeat an enemy or undertake a deadly task. The chaplains of the Silver Templars monitor these oaths, ensuring that their brothers treat their sworn oath with the appropriate respect. Silver Templars' librarians prefer to make use of psychic powers that increase their might or that of their allies. These abilities are used to assist them when they duel a powerful enemy. The Librarius often records the history of the chapter, focusing on their warriors' greatest duels and records of sworn and completed sword oaths. The Apothecaries are responsible for maintaining the chapter's gene seed. They are also entrusted with retrieving bonded weapons of fallen brothers. These weapons are then returned to Colossus. Deep within the fortress monastery, they are displayed upon the walls of the vast Hall of the Fallen, until Master Weaponsmiths deem it's time to return them to service. Ancients are veterans who bear the Silver Templar's standards to war. They will gradually die before they drop their banner, for it is a mark of great dishonour upon the whole chapter should one fall into the hands of the enemy. Battle line squads are the backbone of Silver Templar's armies. Silver Templar's intercessors operate as line infantry, putting their bolt rifles to use, stopping enemy assaults. Silver Templar's warriors apply their dueling expertise and weapon skill to every weapon they use, be it bolt rifle, pistol or blade. In firefights, a squads will target a single enemy unit, picking an enemy warrior each and engaging them in a contest of marksmanship. In this manner, they systematically carve their way through enemy forces, one target at a time. Even when forced to fight hand-to-hand, -hand, an intercessor is still a formidable foe, and will tear into their enemy with combat blades, rifle butts and ceramite fists. Each squad is led by a sergeant, an experienced warrior schooled in leadership. As veteran duelists, sergeants will attempt to isolate and duel enemy leaders and other powerful foes. On these occasions, his squad will often be tasked with clearing a path to the target, allowing their sergeant to draw his power sword and move in for the kill. Close support squads are the vanguard of most space marine attacks. They are deployed to harass and disrupt the enemy before the main space marine force arrives. Silver Templars use their rivers in a similar manner to other Codex-compliant chapters, launching quick and brutal attacks and demoralizing their foes. Silver Templar's Inceptors, meanwhile, are often deployed to undertake surgical strikes on targets marked by their rival allies. They thunder through the atmosphere, slamming into the enemy with incredible force and decimating their unsuspecting victims with volleys from twin assault bolters or plasma exterminators. The Hellblasters of the Silver Templars chapter are drawn from warriors who show the utmost discipline and laser-sharp focus. They pick their targets with cold, calculating efficiency. As one, they select a prime target and reduce it to slag before moving on to the next. They are still expert hand-to-hand -hand fighters with an independent streak but they are able to suppress this side of their personality to complete any mission. 
If Silver Templar Hellblasters represent the warrior of Nuvaris' ability to focus, the aggressors represent the fury they unleash upon the Imperium's countless enemies. Their powered gauntlets smash through defences and rip open armoured panels with ease while gouts of searing flame and hails of bolt rounds devastate entire enemy units. Many of the Silver Templar's greatest warriors have served as aggressors, swearing that learning to compensate for the restricted movement and bulk of Gravis armor has improved their skill tenfold. Transport vehicles are a key component of any Space Marine Rapid Strike Force, and the Templars are no different. They have access to a variety of vehicles, but it is the heavily armoured Repulsor that has cemented its place as their transport of choice. The Repulsor armoured transport is a relatively new vehicle, designed and constructed on Mars in order to serve the newly created Primaris Space Marines. During the Ultima founding, these vehicles were distributed amongst existing Space Marine chapters to serve their new Primaris recruits. Chapters such as the Silver Templars, whose ranks are completely made up of Primaris Space Marines, use the Repulsor as their primary transport and battle tank, because apparently they simply can't fit into existing vehicles such as the mighty Land Raider and ubiquitous Rhino, which have served the Imperium for generations. Odd that. The Repulsor's heavy weaponry is more than capable of taking on even the most heavily armoured of enemy tanks. Meanwhile, its armour is tough enough to absorb punishing fire and its repulsor technology allows it to traverse terrain that would be impassable to other vehicles. The Silver Templars operate their repulsors in an aggressive manner, using them to outflank enemy forces and deposit their hardest-hitting troops in positions to do the most damage. With their troops unloaded, the repulsors are free to engage enemy armour, each picking a target and engaging in long-range duels with their opponents. Having seen constant warfare since its founding, the chapter has already produced a high number of expert tank commanders. The chapter has already distinguished itself in multiple engagements and a number of its brothers have distinguished themselves personally. These four are the most well-known of the current Silver Templars. Grand Oathkeeper Hecaton. Chaplain Lampros Hecaton is amongst the most veteran warriors of his newborn chapter, and the highest-ranking chaplain in the Silver Templars. As Grand Oathkeeper, it is he who oversees the sword oath sworn by his brothers, ensuring they are upheld and bestowing honours upon those that complete them. Hackathon is a mighty warrior in his own right, and his name has already been carved into the chapter's mythology. During the liberation of Novaris, he held the mountainous Kandara in pass against an advancing band of heretic Astartes. In the midst of a violent storm, with the battle raging around him, he chanted the litanies of battle. Each swing of his crozius arcanum was accompanied by the booming roll of thunder and the violent death of a traitor. By his actions on that day, many Novarians were saved. Captain Patricius Captain Zeno Patricius of the Third Company was the first Novarian native to rise to the position of captain within the chapter. His progress through the training regimes of the Silver Templars was meteoric, and his swordsmanship superior even to that of his chapter master. In addition to being a skilled warrior, he is a tactical mastermind, locating weaknesses in the enemy line and launching audacious attacks against overwhelming numbers of enemies. He carries the power sword Animus, whose blade was forged by his own hand. 
the weapon's cross guard is studded with Novarian gemstones, and the blade is delicately inscribed with the motto of the Silver Templars, Focus and Fury. In the hands of Patricius, Animus has dealt the Emperor's justice to the many enemies of mankind. Ancient Corallon the Silver Templars have battled many enemies of the Imperium in their short history, and always the chapter's banners have remained aloft, inspiring Battle Brothers to acts of heroism. Whilst defending Hill 34 during the Orc attack on Corwain's Bane, Corallon's Third Company command was surrounded by ravening greenskins. Even as his brothers fell, he maintained his grasp on the banner, refusing to let the sacred symbol of his chapter fall to the Xenos filth. When the rest of the Third Company arrived to reinforce their overwhelmed leaders, Hill 34 had been buried beneath a mountain of corpses. At the centre of this carnage was the bloodied and battered ancient Corallon, alive amidst the dead. His banner was still held aloft, and a mountain of greenskins lay at his feet. Sergeant Anixius In the hands of a Primaris intercessor, the bolt rifle is amongst the deadliest infantry weapons in the known galaxy. Sergeant Anixius has spent many a long year perfecting the art of bolt rifle marksmanship. As with most Silver Templar intercessors, he has a preference for the stalker pattern bolt rifle, trusting himself to out-aim his opponent and fell them with a single well-placed shot. An enemy unfortunate enough to be a target of Anixius can count his remaining life in seconds, for the sergeant's aim is unhearing. In more than a dozen battles, Sergeant Anixius' bolt rifle has accounted for an enemy commander, crushing the morale of the foe. Each sword of Anixius swears, promises his chapter yet more victims, and continues an ongoing cycle of violence and death. The chapter has taken the world of Nuvaris as its homeworld, sandwiched between the Maelstrom and the centre of the Sisistrix Maledictum in the Ultima Segmentum, nearby in galactic terms to the Segmentum Solar. Novaris is a large world of huge oceans, soaring mountain ranges, vast deserts and dense mangrove swamps. Its people are hardy folk, brilliant swordsmen and expert weaponsmiths. They revere the Silver Templars and serve them as a great honour. The humans that make Narvaris their home live in a low-tech, feudal society. Kingdoms both large and small cover the planet, each ruled by noble families. Weaponsmithing is seen as the highest art, and every Novarian warrior must craft his own weapon as a rite of passage. Before Novaris was liberated by the Silver Templars, the planet spent several long decades under the control of the Flawless Host. This slanesh worshipping Chaos Warband was envious of the quality of craftsmanship displayed by the Novarians, and enslaved thousands to make weapons for them. This dark period in Novaris's history was ended when the Indomitus Crusade arrived. The Silver Templars cleansed the Flawless Host from the planet and saved those Novarians who remained uncorrupted. Novarian warriors are famed for their dueling skills, and many kingdoms will settle disputes with a duel between champions. A dueling has become an important part of the Silver Templar's culture as a result. Potential recruits are required to attend a grand tournament in the foothills below the chapter's fortress monastery, Colossus. There, aspirants duel to the death in the hope of being one of the few chosen to ascend the winding mountain paths to the fortress of the Silver Templars. To put things in perspective, 
I give a rough and fairly brief outline of the events that have transpired for the Silver Templars. In M41, Gilliman is reborn, followed shortly afterwards by the creation of the Great Rift and the fall of Cadia. What followed was the Ultima founding, as we know, the unleashing of the Primaris. Rebute Gilliman launches the Indomitus Crusade, carving a path across the galaxy and smiting alien, traitor and demon alike. During his crusade, Belisarius Call unveils his greatest work, the Primaris Space Marines. They are faster, tougher and stronger than normal Space Marines. Many new chapters are founded and presented with chapter planets. The Silver Templars are founded towards the end of the Indomitus Crusade from amongst the ranks of the Unnumbered Sons. They are granted the feudal world of Novaris as their chapter planet. The liberation of Novaris then proceeds. The newly chosen chapter master of the Silver Templars, Achilleos Zanaris, leads his chapter to the surface of the planet, only to find that the populace has been enslaved by the heretic Astartes of the Flawless Host. The Silver Templars and the heretics engage in a short but fierce war, resulting in the deaths of a quarter of Novaris's population. Eventually, Captain Ducas of the First Company defeats the flawless host's leader, Larius Soul Slaver, in a duel that lasts almost a day. With Soul Slaver's defeat, the battle for Novaris is soon won. After settling upon the world of Novaris, the next major engagement the Silver Templars engaged in was the defeat of Vorma the Ascendant. The corrupted priest spread his foul dogma, promising everlasting life to his followers and delivering only horrific mutation and rivers of blood. Adeptus Sororitas forces of the Order of Our Martyred Lady attempt to hold the heretics at bay, but they are overrun. As the sisters prepare to martyr themselves, as they like to do, their calls to prayer were answered. From the heavens descended angels of death, clad in silvered armor. The arrival of the Silver Templars turns the battle in favor of the Imperium. The heretics are utterly destroyed. Next was the Plague Wars. The Silver Templars learned of the Death Guard's assault on the 500 worlds. The first, second and third companies are immediately dispatched to assist their ultramarine kin. They quickly find themselves involved in heavy fighting. Chapter Master Zenarius displays his matchless swordsmanship, defeating several Death Guard lords and mighty demons of Nurgle in single combat. The Death Guard are beaten and fall back to their domain in the Scourge Stars. It was the campaign conducted by the Third Company, however, which solidified the Silver Templar's reputation for fearlessness and bravery in the face of overwhelming odds and devastating losses. This campaign is called in the histories the Siege of Talisar Secundus. Led by Captain Petrachius, the Third Company arrived in the Ultramar system to join a small force of successor chapters in defense of the hive world Talisar Secundus. A control of the task force had been given to Captain Aurelius Lobos of the Nova Marines Fifth Company, the most experienced of the Space Marine commanders. By the time the Imperial forces reached the surface, Talisar Secundus was already succumbing to the devastating diseases and viral bombardments unleashed by the Death Guard forces. Much of the human population was infected with foul contagion, coughing their lungs out into the dirt. The fortunate died swiftly. The rest found their souls corrupted and were transformed into boiling, crusted, shambling pox walkers. 
The walking dead surged across the surface of the planet, harrying the space marines as the Death Guard forces used the distraction to land more plague marines. As they fought running battles with the hordes of poxwalkers, the space marines formed defensive lines around the hive cities and dug in, preparing for the inevitable plague marine assault. For weeks, the Space Marines held their lines. The Silver Templars battled back to back with their Nova Marine allies, fighting day and night to hold back the press of Death Guard warriors. Assailed on both sides by pox walkers and heavily armed Plague Marines, the Space Marines eventually began to falter. Sensing weakness, the Death Guard made their final push. In a tightly organized infantry formation, the Death Guard swarmed over the Space Marine defenders, reaping a terrible toll on the Imperial lines, their bloated bodies absorbing bolter rounds as they marched forward. The two armies clashed in furious hand-to-hand combat. The Primaris Space Marines were greatly outnumbered, but fought with great skill picking out opposing champions and besting hulking plague marines in brutal duels. Still, the Death Guard came on, climbing over the dead and dying to reach their enemies. Marching amidst his putrid troops was the hulking form of a Death Guard Lord of Contagion. Wherever this giant warrior stepped, the life around him withered and rotted, as Nurgle's blessings worked their putrid magic. Captain Patracius knew that he had to act in order to avoid a crashing defeat. Only the death of the Lord of Contagion would halt the Death Guard advance. He would have to engage this mighty enemy in single combat. Meanwhile, the Nova Marines under Captain Lobos were being swamped by demons and plague marines. Lobos, seeing that the line would soon break, ordered the space marines to fall back to the hive and regroup until reinforcements arrived. Amongst the Silver Templars, however, these calls fell on deaf ears. Patracius had made his decision. He blocked out the enraged bellows of the Nova Marine's captain, his mind utterly focused on slaying his chosen target. He ordered his troops to clear a path. The Silver Templars fought with frighteningly cold precision. They exchanged few words, moving as one to cut through the enemy lines until they were surrounded on all sides by hordes of plague marines. Dozens of Silver Templars fell, but eventually they cleared a route to the enemy commander. Patracius wasted no time with words, charging directly towards the scythe-wielding Death Guard Lord. The duel between the two warriors was epic, with the Silver Templars captain suffering terrible wounds that would have killed a lesser man. Despite his injuries, Petrachius's superior combat skill still showed, and with a final swing, he cut down the Death Guard Lord. With their chain of command disrupted, the Death Guard assault began to grind to a shuddering halt. The Space Marines pursued the faltering warriors of Nurgle as they retreated, putting hundreds of them to the sword and chasing them from the planet's surface. The Silver Templars had carried the day, but the event had driven a wedge between the Swords of Navaris and their Nova Marine allies. Their attack had left gaps in the Space Marines' line, and the Nova Marines had been surrounded and nearly overwhelmed by hordes of advancing Plague Marines. Captain Lobus had lost fully half of his warriors after the Silver Templars charged from their positions, He did not mask his fury at the Silver Templar's failure to obey direct orders. Captain Lobus grieved at the devastating losses his men had suffered and vowed never to forgive or forget the disobedient and reckless behavior of the Silver Templars. Captain Petrachius refused to admit any error, 
coldly pointing out that the death of the enemy commander had surely saved the day, and that losses were always acceptable in the pursuit of victory. This argument did little to calm Lobus, who, in the conclusion of the conflict, left the planet in disgust. And despite both chapters being scions of Gilliman, a bitter enmity would linger between many members of the two chapters from then on. Worth remembering, my comrades. The Battle of Retsos. The Silver Templars refer to their next major engagement as the War of the Bond Marshal. Silver Templar's Lieutenant Retsos and his forces are ambushed by Drakari raiders. It happens to everybody now and again. Retsos is disarmed during the battle, a matter of great shame. Desperate to regain his honour, the lieutenant obsessively hunts the foul Xenos creatures across an entire sector. Several months later, he catches up to the raiders, slaying scores and snatching his weapon from an archon's cold, dead hands. Retsos, however, is soon cut down by the Jukari, but dies with his honour intact. The Silver Templar's holdings border a region of space densely populated by greenskins, so they have found themselves in conflict with the Green Menace for a great deal of their short existence as a chapter. Near the end of the Indomitus Crusade, a Silver Templar strike force found refuge on the industrial planet of Nectis. Grateful for the assistance of the locals, the Silver Templars swore a sword oath to protect Nekthis. And several decades later, this oath would be fulfilled. High in the mountains of Novaris, at the peak of the fortress monastery Colossus, Chief Librarian Aeonus was awoken from his meditations by a powerful vision. His mind raced with scenes of rampaging green-skinned warriors, cleaving axes and the death cries of outmatched human defenders. A single name came to his lips, Nekthis. Immediately, he recalled an oath of protection sworn many years ago. As the visions faded, Ionus raced from his chambers. He knew the sword oath must be fulfilled. Alerting Chapter Master Zenarius to the danger, he offered to lead the forces of the second and third companies to Nectis, and fulfil the Chapter's oath by rescuing the stricken planet from an invasion of deadly orcs. Such was the intensity of Ionus's astropathic vision that he considered more than an entire battle company necessary to combat the threat. Upon arrival in the Nexus system, it became clear that his decision had been wise. Dozens of ramshackle orc vessels drifted lazily in orbit above the planet. They began pivoting to face the newly arrived space marines. The Silver Templar's fleet moved in to attack, launching dropships as they began blasting the orc vessels to pieces. Ionus scanned the surface of Nectis and began directing operations from the bridge of the strike cruiser Novarian Dawn. The orcs had broken the planet's meager defences, leaving most of the survivors trapped in the remains of the capital, Nectis City. A force would be sent to bolster the city, while Ionus and the second company would concentrate on splitting the orc forces and eliminating their leadership. The initial strikes met with great success. Inceptors hammered the orc lines, punching through the greenskins, targeting orc leaders and causing the orcs to lose what little discipline they possessed. Rivers landed in the no-man's land between forces, striking at orc command assets and disrupting their supply routes. If the Space Marines had expected a swift victory, however, they were to be sorely disappointed. The Orcs regrouped, showing greater tactical ability and toughness than any greenskins the Silver Templars had fought before. At the fore strode giant Orc knobs, their arms covered in the carapaces of fallen Xenos creatures, crude weapons dealing death amidst the Silver Templars' battle line. Lieutenant Menarchius' demi-company held their position atop the city walls as best they could, but they were being thinned at every turn. 
Scores of precious space marine lives were lost amidst the carnage, and every orc they slew seemed to be replaced by a dozen more. The trophies the orcs carried marked them as freebooters that had been hardened in battle against hundreds of enemies across the galaxy. They were experienced and would not break easily. When a giant orc warboss emerged from a rumbling battle wagon to assault the city walls, Ionis knew the turning point had come. With the captain of the second company, Vatranus Leontius, at his side, Ionis descended to the walls of Nactus City. Atop the battlements he fought, cloak billowing behind him as his four-sword fell target after target. Eyes glowing with the power of the Immaterium, he lent his psychic might to the martial carnage of Captain Leontius, and together the two of them rallied the troops and slew the orc leader. By the third day, Lieutenant Menarchius and close to a third of the Space Marines had been slain, but the line had held and the orc numbers had been decimated. With the prospect of loot fading, and having suffered terrible losses, the orc attack began to falter, as they fought amongst themselves for command. It was then that Chief Librarian Aeonus again came to the fore. The power of the warp still coursing through his veins, he led a punishing charge into the depths of the orc ranks. The orcs were sent scurrying away from the city walls, only to be pursued by rival hunting parties. There would be no retreat for the orcs, for in orbit their fleet had been reduced to molten scrap. Nakthis had been spared, and the sword elf fulfilled. According to my records, the last major engagement the Silver Templars have participated in as of this date is Raguk Speed War. The orc warboss Raguk had unleashed a speed war on the agri-world of Orman's Hearth. Orc vehicles churn the earth, spoiling crops and sending black smoke belching into the air. A distress call reaches the Silver Templars, who swiftly respond. The Orc forces are eventually lured into a narrow valley by Silver Templars' gunships. The chapter's repulsors and hellblasters lie in wait, ending the war in a few brief moments. And with that, I believe we can conclude. My lord, the Primaris Space Marines continue to be adopted by all of the existing Space Marine chapters, and also, as the Silver Templars were, formed from amongst the ranks of the unnumbered sons or directly raised by Gilliman's order from Call's laboratories. We still await to see what the results of this change in the balance of power will be, but as ever... As your loyal servant, I will monitor the situation and alert you to any events. May the Emperor preserve you, my lord. Inquisitor A.B. Prince. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this little exploration of this chapter. I'll be doing more stuff like this again. I used to do uh, sort of Space Marine lore fairly regular. I'm going to go back to doing some of them because uh, there's a lot of new stuff come out and it's quite interesting but anyway I'm going to be off if you wouldn't mind liking this video I'd really appreciate that and uh, subscribe if you're not subscribed and let me know in the comments what you thought this is new Primaris law this is what we get which isn't that bad to be honest it's fine it just feels wrong anyway I will see you again next time and uh, yeah thanks to everybody supporting the channel you can see your names here really means a lot lads thank you very much and uh, yeah I will see you again next time. Bye-bye. I'm rambling. Cheers. <laughs>